Good afternoon and welcome to today's Compliance Week webcast. I'm Joe McCafferty, Executive Editor of Compliance Week, and I'll be hosting today's session. This afternoon we're going to be talking about how project portfolio management can enable regulatory mastery. Before we hear from our guests, let me quickly go over the agenda for this afternoon. We're scheduled to go for one hour. I'll give a brief introduction and then we'll jump into the presentation, sponsored this afternoon by Oracle. The presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. Your questions are important to us and will be kept confidential, so don't be shy. You can ask your question at any time by using the ask a question function on the left hand side of your screen. I'll pose them to our guests at the end of the presentation, but you don't have to wait till the end to ask them. I encourage you uh, to ask them as they occur to you through the presentation and we're more likely to get to them. After the q and I'll wrap up the webcast. Today's session will also offer CPE credits for attendees. To obtain your CPE credit, wait until the call is completely over and I sign off. And at that point, the final exam will be presented automatically in a separate window. If you have any trouble viewing the CPE test or getting the CPE certificate, just send an email to info, I-N-F-O, at compliancework.com to request a copy. A few other administrative details at any time during the presentation, you can download the slides from the drop-down menu that's on the left-hand side of your screen. You can also hit, hit a button, view slide full screen button to increase the size of the slides. Lastly, a help button is located at the upper right-hand corner of your screen for assistance. Today's webcast is part of a series that Compliance Week launched a few years ago. We hold these webcasts just about every week, usually on Thursdays. Our guests have been chief compliance and governance officers at leading public companies on, and experts on various compliance, regulatory governance, and risk topics. For details on our upcoming webcasts, you can visit www.compliancework.com. And also don't miss the deadline for registering for Compliance Week's annual conference. We're holding that May 19th through the 21st in Washington, D.C. Um, the early bird deadline has been uh, extended to January 31st, so I encourage you, if you're interested in that, uh, please do get on that. Uh, slots are filling up. Um, now, let's move on to our program. Today, we're very happy to have with us Mike Metcalf, Director, Services Industry Strategy for Oracle. Mike, who will be moderating today's session, is a Director for Oracle and is responsible for financial services life sciences, retail, and telecommunications industry strategy. We're very pleased to have you here, Mike. Do you want to get us started? Great. Thanks, Joe. <clears throat> and good day, everyone. Uh, before I uh, get into the main presentation, just a little more context on <clears throat> the role that I play at Oracle. Uh, I am actually with the Primavera Global Business Unit uh, within Oracle. And the Primavera uh, Global Business Unit is dedicated to Enterprise Project and Portfolio Management Solutions, um, EPPM. And we de deliver EPPM solutions spanning, spanning the enterprise that address a number of different uh, business challenges uh, and use cases, uh, including business process change and improvement, uh, new product development and introduction, IT project and portfolio management, capital projects, facilities management, and, and many, many others. Uh, but this business unit is dedicated to uh, enterprise portfolio management solutions. And uh, today's presentation is really around the, the role that PPM plays in uh, supporting uh, uh, regulatory compliance and, and how you can, be, you can master change associated with regu regulatory compliance using PPM. Um, and although this presentation specifically relates to financial services, uh, or many of the, the data points in it uh, relate to financial service regulations. Uh, it's really the concepts are applicable to uh, you know, a wide variety of industries that are highly regulated. So with that, we'll look at uh, some of the, the best practices and concepts that we want to cover today. <clears throat> so although this presentation is focused on regulatory mastery, it's important, I think, to understand the broader business context in which uh, compliance efforts uh, are conducted. Uh, so let me take, you know, financial services as an example. I think it's fair to say that uh, the financial services industry has never uh, faced as fierce a situation of competition as it does now. Um, rapidly evolving cloud, mobile, and social technologies uh, presenting consumers with new ways to research, buy, and use 
uh, products, everything from insurance to loans and even methods of payment. And, and like it or not, financial services organizations are rapidly becoming technology companies as they try to meet the needs of the digital, digital consumer. So innovation is taking place at a rapid pace within uh, financial services and, and within many industries, and that is a backdrop to the compliance that's taking place at the same time. Uh, another driver, in addition to uh, regulation, which is uh, within financial services, obviously a, a critical issue right now as we, as we enter a period of, of heightened regulation, but another driver is the context of, of the macroeconomic environment that the uh, financial services exist in and, and all other businesses. Um, uh, so the macroeconomic environment really means that uh, businesses need to uh, uh, align their strategy rapidly and they're making rapid business changes uh, to take account of the macroeconomic uncertainty. So there are major changes taking place uh, within the business at the same time as all of this change being inflicted through the regulations. And I think that's an important concept to understand as we move forward and look at how uh, PPM can help manage this, this complex environment. So let me look specifically now at <clears throat> some of the, the key issues around regulatory expansion within financial services. Uh, the chart here is from data collected by the Mercatus Center at the George Mason University. <clears throat> and um, if you search for Mercatus, you can find <clears throat> the site and uh, drill into this chart in much more detail, uh, together with the methodology they use to uh, determine this index. But what's being shown here is uh, a number of different industries, including financial services, which is the red, the red line and the number of regulations or rules. <clears throat> and you, know, the, you can uh, go to the site to determine how they, how they actually identify the number of rules. But you can see the trends uh, for many industries, particularly financial services, uh, are becoming somewhat of a hockey stick uh, over the years as regulations increase and pile on. And in fact, if the, uh, and another report that's uh, related to this, the American Action Forum produced a report that showed that the cost of regulatory expansion between 2008 and 2012 was in excess of $500 billion. And in 2012 alone, uh, commodities and securities regulation was estimated at around $12 billion. And also in 2012, the, uh, the data shows that the number one driver of additional cost uh, was for financial services was the Dodd-Frank Act that uh, you know, is, is creating considerable change and upheaval uh, across uh, financial services and other industries. So the pattern here is clear. Uh, this is, is not a blip. Uh, we're, we've entered a period, in particularly in financial services, of heightened regulation. Uh, this is the new norm. And I think it's time to look at uh, you know, the, the way organizations uh, organize themselves, the processes and tools they use to operate efficiently in this period of, of heightened regulation. Uh, so this will be a, a, um, a situation that organizations will be facing for some time. And you know, the ad hoc way that many organizations have addressed this uh, simply will not last as these, as these regulations increase in scope and magnitude. So let's take a look at the uh, Dodd-Frank Act in a little more detail, as that was the, the number one driver, and, and, and what can we learn from this? So this data comes from a recent survey, survey by uh, Oracle partner Accenture. The report, called Coming to Terms with the Dodd-Frank Act, surveyed around 100 uh, financial services companies and around 30 resource companies, you know, mining, extraction companies, and, and energy uh, across North America and Europe. The survey hi highlights the, uh, the strategic impact of regulations such as the Dodd-Frank Act. In addition to the changes to policies, procedures, and systems, it shows that the Dodd-Frank Act is forcing organizations to evaluate current and planned products and even entire businesses to limit risk and exposure to these new regulations. So it's not simply a matter of changing 
existing operating procedures. Uh, the acts like the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, the Consumer Protection Act, um, uh, are having significant impact at a business and a strategy level. So simply put, addressing the Dodd-Frank Act requires an unprecedented level of business transformation and change with impacts across the entire organization. But you can see in the long run uh, with the survey results, um, the, the majority of organizations see the Dodd-Frank Act as having a positive impact on their business. The survey also shows that many organizations, however, are not that well prepared uh, to deal with it. So when 85% believe DFA will require a rethink of business models, uh, and over 70% think it will uh, overall improve profitability and, um, and cause them to revise long-term strategies, it is alarming that more organizations aren't in the blue area where they're extremely well prepared to deal with all the changes. So this is just one example of a regulation that's having a major business impact. Um, and, and organizations not being prepared to deal with all those impacts. Let me take another look at, at this particular uh, regulation and, and, and show some of the complexities. This chart is provided by another of uh, Oracle's business partners, Deloitte, and I think it's a rather uh, clever way of showing the, the um, Dodd-Frank Act along with the Consumer Protection Act, uh, the number of agencies, the titles, uh, the rules, and the timeline uh, associated with all of this change. Now this is, you know, uh, I think probably a, the simplest way you could show this, but it, even in even this chart, it's very complex as you can see. So what we have is, is uh, you know, numerous uh, agencies, titles, and regulations uh, with, uh, an enormous set of deadlines and timelines that need to be tracked. And as you can see at the bottom of this chart, and this is, you know, is about uh, uh, a year old or so, uh, but even now at the bottom of this chart, you can see that many of the regulations have yet to be finalized. So this is unfolding and will be unfolding for, you know, uh, you know months if not years to come. So this is a tremendous amount of change that needs to be tracked. And typically what we found uh, is many organizations are trying to do this with rudimentary tools. We'll talk a bit more about the uh, information systems that are available to, to support this, but the actual change management process, the tracking and control, is largely being done with ad hoc tools. And with this degree of change, with this new norm of heightened regulation, uh, I think many organizations are realizing that it's time to make a change. It's time to you know, invest in a much more robust framework in order to be able to deal with this degree of change. And that's really the subject of the rest of this presentation. Let me take a look at one more uh, view of the complexity of regulation. And again, this is specific to financial services, but I think that you know, you'd find other industries where uh, the complexity is as, uh, as, as bad. Um, this is a chart that was included in a letter that Jamie Dimon sent to shareholders in, I believe, 2011. And what it shows is the number of different agencies, both existing and new, and the degree of overlap that they have uh, over specific areas of, in this case, obviously, J.P. Morgan Chase's business. Uh, what it highlights is the fact that these regulatory bodies, these regulators, these agencies, uh, you know, are run the risk of, of duplicate and even conflicting regulatory standards. So the complexity is increased because of the number of regulatory bodies or agencies. So not only do we have very complex uh, regulations that have strategic business impact like Dodd-Frank, but that, but it's compounded by many, many different regulatory bodies, you know, with potentially overlapping and conflicting regulations. This is an enormous degree of complexity and change. And, you know, unless organizations really uh, invest in a, in a solid framework to manage that change, uh, they run the risk of, uh, you know, missing key deadlines, facing stiff penalties, uh, and they're already 
hiring armies of individuals and people to uh, address this challenge right now. So we'll talk about how do you get ahead of this? How do you uh, create a posture uh, so that you can really manage this more effectively? Let me leave you with one more quote from, from Jamie. Um, and I like this quote because I think it really does encapsulate the, the magnitude of the problem. Um, and again, this was uh, in the annual report and his letter to shareholders. Uh, over the next few years, the estimate is that tens of thousands of people will work on these regulatory changes, with 3,000 of them will be dedicated uh, to this effort at a cost of close to $3 billion. And in fact, I think in December of last year, uh, Jamie revised this uh, and estimates that in 2014 alone, the cost to J.P. Morgan Chase will be close to $2 billion. Um, I think on average, the numbers that uh, are reported is that for financial services institutions, you know, on average, it's, it's 10 to $15 million annually on regulatory compliance. Now, that obviously varies based on the size of the organization and the number of business lines they're in. But it's a significant cost, and it's only getting higher. So let's look at what the change management process looks like for regulatory compliance. And, and here's a very simple model. At the highest level, we can think of, of change management really for compliance as a three-step process. Uh, the first step is really to understand the current situation or the current business understand and document uh, all of the products, processes, systems, and, and people, and their relationship to the business. So unless you understand the current model, planning for change is obviously uh, difficult and not impossible. Now, in an ideal world, the IT organization within your uh, enterprise may already have documented much of this information. Uh, a common term for this type of data is, is portfolios. So you would find you'd have a portfolio of products or the product portfolio, uh, a, uh, a portfolio of your systems or applications, so your application for portfolio. And, and, and even in more mature organizations, you might find that the processes have all already been documented and are in a process portfolio. So that's a good starting point uh, to understand you know, what are the, the assets the systems, the procedures uh, that are affected uh, by this regulatory uh, change. So that's the starting point, is to, is to really fully understand in a formalized way th the business that you have today. But it's also important to note that the business continues to evolve while we're making these regulatory changes. We're, we're, we're not in, in uh, status quo, uh, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, where financial services is at a period of, of increasing innovation just to keep pace with all of the, the, the new competitors that are out there. So there, there are tremendous changes taking place in, uh, in the, the channels for consumers, uh, providing them with services you know, from the cloud, mobile, and social. There are new products and services being implemented at a much more rapid pace. This is the backdrop to all of this regulatory change as well. So this portfolio management, this portfolio of processes and systems and applications and procedures is constantly evolving and needs to be maintained. So it's not simply a catalog. It is a living thing that needs to be maintained. So as new products and services are planned, they need to be captured because they uh, represent uh, potential uh, risk for compliance issues. So once we've captured the current state, uh, we can then plan for change. Uh, and the next step entails you know, reviewing all of the, the new regulations and rules and, and developing a comprehensive change roadmap that addresses the key issues. And as I mentioned earlier, with some of these regulations, those decisions include things like which businesses or services to exit or enter, which products to keep, divest, or, or even develop if there are new products that uh, that are required, uh, and which business processes need to be changed to comply with the regulations. So this comprehensive uh, change roadmap 
uh, you know, then acts as the key vehicle for communication across the organization. As, as these changes impact, as Jamie Dimon says, uh, almost every aspect of the business. So the final step then is the communication of that change roadmap and, and cascading that change plan down and across the organization. Uh, now the change plan or, or roadmap will at least include a portfolio of regulatory change projects, uh, including the deadlines and milestones. Uh, it'll include details of the businesses, products, systems, procedures that require uh, change or, or, or review. And it should also include an initial estimate of the resource requirements and budgets for each change initiative. I think you know, what we're seeing now is uh, uh, tremendous hiring taking place across the industry as organizations you know, are throwing bodies at this problem. But already, and I'll show you later, uh, you know, this hiring is, is reaching a point where organizations are struggling to find skilled resources. So it really becomes now a question of efficient use of resources uh, when you know, these resources are, can, uh, are scarce. So better management of the resources uh, required for compliance, better control of costs are going to be critical uh, as, we, uh, as we move forward in this period of, of heightened regulation. So once this, this change plan has been communicated, uh, then the, there's a step of synchronizing what we would term a top-down uh, plan, the, the you know, initial roadmap for change with the individual um, organization's bottom-up planning. So all of the organizations responsible for uh, supporting and contributing to these change plans will then be able to coordinate their efforts at a more detailed level. And that's where any inconsistencies can be identified. So where the initial plan might look good at a top-down level, uh, when each individual operating unit and, and function looks at what they have to do, that's when the discrepancies occur. That's when they can push back and say, uh, you know, we need more resources to do this. Uh, this conflicts with things that we're already doing. Um, you know, there are dependencies that, you know, are not met, which prevent us from completing our work. All of those issues can be resolved well before uh, the actual problem arises because you've basically got a forward-looking plan that has both top-down and bottom-up uh, scrutiny. So this is a, a, a fairly simple way to look at uh, you know, the change management process. And of course, uh, you know, in order to do this, you really need trustworthy data, a single source of truth for this plan and roadmap, and, and a robust set of capabilities to help uh, you know, the planning uh, across and down the organization. So let me take a look now at some more data that came from the uh, Accenture report. And what, they, uh, what the report did was it, it identified the key internal and external challenges uh, reported by the folks that were surveyed. Again, this was around uh, 100 financial services organizations and 30 in, in resource-intensive organizations. So I won't spend too much time on the external challenges. I think everyone's familiar with these, uh, you know, but, you know, the delays in, in uh, getting published and finalized regulations, uh, not all of them very clear and specific and requiring a lot of, uh, of double-checking. Um, the lack of detail. And again, the uh, competing or, or differing global standards. This was the, the message that Jamie was conveying where you know, multiple regulators are not, uh, not collaborating and you know, giving rise to competing or conflicting regulations. So it's a very confusing uh, entry point for the, the change process. But you know, that's where you know, some of the technologies like governance, risk, and compliance solutions can really help. And I'll talk more about that later in the presentation. Um, but on the right-hand side, the internal issues, uh, I would argue that almost all of these uh, can be addressed with technologies that are available today, uh, and specifically, obviously, PPM. Um, I'm going to focus in on a few of them for the purposes of this presentation, 
but I think that you know implementing a robust uh, framework for regulatory compliance and change management, I think many, if not all of these uh, internal issues can be alleviated uh, to some degree. But if we look at the, the list, strategy, uh, starting with that, you know, many organizations uh, struggle with communicating a clear strategy and plan across the organization. Um, as I mentioned earlier, most organizations are using a collection of uh, um, ad hoc productivity tools, spreadsheets, documents that are really ill suited to the task of coordinating the efforts of multiple organizations and functions across the enterprise, clearly showing why the change is taking place, which regulations are being addressed, what the deadlines are, what the penalties might be, how to prioritize these changes in the context of everything else that's taking place. That can be done much more effectively when you have a robust uh, tool set and framework to communicate that across the organization. You know, commitment. You know, we have to understand that, you know, many of the of the individuals involved in these compliance efforts, you know, have a full-time job. Um, you know, they're doing what they believe is the most important thing, and unless they're shown uh, in a meaningful way where these compliance tasks uh, belong and the relative priority of these things in, the, in relation to what they're already doing, uh, without you know, clearly communicating that, it's unlikely that employees will provide the, their, the level of commitment that's required. We talked earlier about hiring skilled staff. Uh, you looked at the, the numbers of individuals that uh, Jamie Dimon talks about for compliance at J.P. Morgan Chase, and, and I think you'll see you know, every day uh, there are open uh, positions for uh, uh, folks to support compliance efforts, whether it be um, you know, project management or uh, you know, other areas of risk and compliance. But you know, uh, we can't continue to add bodies at that rate. Uh, we have to look at a more efficient way of using resources uh, as well as you know, being able to hire efficiently um, and, and also forecast the resources in, in a timely way. So. Uh, part of the, the, what I'll show you later is the ability to look further out and understand where the resource gaps are, where, where and when do we need individuals because of an overload of, of resources on specific compliance tasks. So that forward-looking planning is also an important part of, of, of what a PPM solution provides. And then managing the volume of change. Uh, you know, Again, most tools that are used kind of on an ad hoc basis uh, you know, really aren't suited to uh, a truly collaborative environment, uh, making sure that everyone in, involved in these change processes is, uh, has the latest information, uh, you know, understands the steps that they're responsible for and, and, and the, the, uh, p the position that their changes are in, in the context of the overall change effort. So you know, these are important things to communicate uh, to be able to manage this volume of change. So th there's the list of, 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 of issues, key challenges. And what I'd like to do next is to show you specifically where project and portfolio management uh, can be applied to address those particular challenges. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think uh, PPM you could make an argument that it could help with almost all of these internal issues. But I really wanted to focus on, on some very specific ones um, and, you know, to make sure that you know, we can show a clear examples later on in the presentation of how this is addressed. So I've also, on, on this chart, um, introduced this concept of the combination of governance, risk, and compliance, or GRC, and project and portfolio management, PPM. Uh, because uh, many of the folks that are involved in this day-to-day -day and, and live and breathe uh, regulatory compliance will be familiar, I think, with uh, governance, risk, and compliance uh, tools uh, and solutions and vendors. And I wanted to you know, provide some context for how these things fit together. So, so the, the GRC systems in general are managing you know, risk, um, policies, rule changes, um, they're tracking incidents and, and, and case management, and they're providing an audit function. 
So this is really the repository of the rules and the changes, what's required. Um, and you know, they will contain this library or content uh, to varying degrees of completeness. Where PPM fits in is how to manage and orchestrate the changes that need to take place in the business itself. So how do you manage the volume of change projects uh, or change initiatives? Um, how are you going to uh, ensure that your change initiatives are in line with uh, other changes in the business, such as new products and services being introduced, uh, you know, different business strategies being implemented, because as I mentioned earlier, change, the change process is taking place in the context of a moving, a moving target. So, so all of the strategic alignment is something that PPM really takes care of. Uh, the change roadmap itself, um, prioritizing individual change projects, and also uh, having uh, information on other initiatives that are taking place in the enterprise that may uh, compete for resources or, or may uh, conflict with change initiatives. I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, if we're introducing new products and services, uh, it's important that those new products and services uh, are part of the, the portfolio of products that's evaluated with respect to new rules and regulations. So uh, having visibility into what's planned as well as what's already in existence is really important. Um, so all of that you know, future state, uh, as far as possible, should be included. So hopefully this you know, provides some uh, you know, guidance on what the key challenges are that um, many organizations are facing. Um, I'm sure that many of the folks on this call uh, will uh, at least share some of these uh, pain points in common. Um, and, and how you know, two major kind of applications or solutions uh, together can provide a framework for managing this change. Let me drill into that framework a little bit more in detail with this next slide. And uh, this is a little bit more of a, um, a kind of a conceptual view of how this would work. So with the governance risk and compliance solution, uh, the input to this is, is obviously all the new rules and regulations. So all the regulatory changes are constantly being uh, fed into this, this knowledge base. Uh, that you use to, to, to track what it is you have to do. Um, at the top, we've got the project and portfolio management solution. Now, in addition to the stimulus from the GRC system, so that's, you know, we've got a change requirement. Uh, we need to make some changes to uh, either systems, procedures, policies, uh, or, or even, uh, you know, exit a business. Uh, those are being uh, fed into the PPM system. So that's the stimulus from the GRC system. But there are other inputs that the PPM system uh, takes account of, and they are what I would term the strategic alignment. What are the new business strategies? What are the new products and services that are being planned? Um, what business transformation uh, efforts are underway that I need to be aware of to be able to effectively plan my change roadmap, because as I mentioned, you, the, it's a moving target that, that uh, you know, you're reviewing. So, so this, I think, uh, hopefully gives you a, a view of, of how the strategic alignment um, is improved with the combination of your governance risk and compliance solution and your PPM solution. And, and you can see that this really is a very complementary uh, set of capabilities. Uh, that you, you can use to manage this volume of change. So with that, let me move into a little bit more detail and talk about uh, the specific challenges that were mentioned earlier, the, the, uh, the internal issues, and take a look at some examples uh, directly from the Oracle Instantis PPM solution and, and how it can help solve some of those challenges. So with this uh, particular example here, what we're showing is uh, the, uh, really at the strategy level. So, and, and I want, and bear in mind that uh, 
these views are examples. Uh, they are all configurable uh, by the, the, the user uh, in the same way that you would change the layout of your spreadsheet effectively. So it says it's no more difficult than that. But uh, so you know, these columns and what's shown here may vary depending on your role in the organization, uh, your, the function or, or part of the organization that you, you work in, uh, and you can even change it specific to your unique needs. So <clears throat> with this kind of information, what I'm showing here is uh, uh, you know, I can see how initiatives roll up, uh, change initiatives roll up to specific regulations and, in fact, specific strategies. So I'm really looking at, you know, uh, do I have uh, initiatives, am I actually doing something to support every initiative or strategy uh, that we have in place? Um, you know, are all of the regulations uh, that we have to comply with, do they all have some, at least one supporting initiative? If there are no supporting initiatives, uh, you know, does it really mean that we do nothing with this regulation? So this is a way to make sure, you know, you've got alignment and coverage, you know, of change initiatives back to uh, regulations and strategies. So I can ensure all the regulations are being addressed. I can see which change initiatives are on track and which are at risk. Uh, I can also see uh, relative priorities and the responsible individuals for each of those change initiatives. So this is really kind of at this top level where we're really helping to communicate uh, the, the clear strategy and objectives. And this view, you know, would potentially be available to everyone in the organization so they could see clearly what, is, what are the important things that we need to be focused on, um, you know, and, and understand this in the context of, of everything else they need to do. So that's one example. Another area that was highlighted in the uh, Accenture report was managing the volume of changes. And in this example, <clears throat> what I'm showing is uh, drilling in to one specific change initiative. Um, and that's, that's the, uh, the area at the bottom, and you can see more details around uh, deadlines, uh, you know, the dates for specific uh, activities or tasks that need to be completed for this process change. But also, at the top, uh, I'm showing how the uh, built-in uh, social networking capabilities can be used so that everyone involved in, in this particular change initiative, this particular regulatory change, uh, can uh, share and communicate with other team members. So this is much like you know, your Facebook uh, wall, where you're really posting status updates and it's a much more effective way for people to consume, uh, you know, changes and issues and risks associated with these kind of large uh, enterprise change initiatives. So, you know, here's an example of, of you know, how, you know, this becomes a, an everyday tool. Uh, it's something that people can really, uh, you know, get up to the minute uh, uh, status and, and also advice and collaboration uh, to ensure that, you know, deadlines are being met. So another area that was talked about was identifying projects and milestones. Um, here's another view that the Oracle uh, Instantis PPM solution offers, and that's, you know, looking at a timeline view of change initiatives. And, and here it's very easy to see, uh, you know, when things are, uh, you know, slipping, uh, the dependencies, that exist between different steps in the change process. Uh, it's really critical for changes that perhaps impact uh, processes and information systems. Uh, so you've got changes to policies and procedures, um, but you've also got changes to back office systems, and you really need to coordinate the efforts of both the IT organization uh, and the operations, and you know so that you're all um, you know coordinated and, and you know things don't get out of sequence. So, you know, really important to be able to understand the dependencies between these change uh, steps, particularly with cross-functional change initiatives. So let me move on to uh, one other view, and, and this was, uh, again, one of the issues raised uh, in the survey with competing priorities and projects. Um, 
at a portfolio level, um, it's really important to capture as much of the current and future state of things like applications, products, uh, processes, uh, and resources so that you can really uh, uh, effectively prioritize, prioritize the change initiatives at the top level. Only through this can you really uh, ensure that everyone in the organization understands uh, the relative importance of, of the change initiatives uh, in the context of what they're already doing. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, it's just another set of things for them to do and they don't really have the information to, to know you know, what to, uh, what to defer uh, and where to focus. And also, it's a means for people to feed back uh, any potential conflicts. Uh, what you want to be able to do is to highlight these conflicts ahead of time. You want to forecast uh, situations where people are working on too many things or, you know, um, uh, you know, there's a conflict or a dependency between a regulation and, a, and another initiative. You want to be able to forecast those well ahead of time so that they can be resolved early. Uh, what you don't want to do is hit the problem in midstream. So being able to forecast and predict uh, these problems ahead of time is really critical. And, and these types of charts, uh, these types of views, together with trending, uh, you know, storing historical data so that you can see if you're getting better over time or if you're getting worse over time. And if we're trending down, if we're, if we're starting to miss, you know, milestones midstream that might impact a firm deadline, I want to know that sooner than later. I want to be able to make corrective action before I get there. So this is all extremely important information to make those course corrections. So um, another area that we we looked at, and I think this is probably one of the most valuable areas of uh, applying PPM to regulatory compliance and how to really master this, is to look at resources. It was obviously a critical issue uh, in the survey. And what we're showing here is, uh, at the bottom, is, is a heat map. And so either by role um, or, or by individual, uh, I can look at <clears throat> the availability or, or capacity, as we would call it, uh, the demand, uh, demand based on where has this individual been assigned, you know, what compliance steps or tasks has that individual been assigned to, and I can see, you know, areas where it's red where they, they've simply been over-assigned. There's simply not enough hours in the day for them to complete everything that they're ex expected to do during that time period, whether it be a week or a month. Um, so using this, uh, again, you can predict or forecast where the resource bottlenecks will be and, and you know, either negotiate for another resource or it may be, you know, I can go and contract out those resources uh, or, or I can, uh, you know, persuade the owner of the other tasks to delay that work in favor of mine and, again, use, you know, the priorities set at the senior level to help negotiate that trade-off. Um, at a macro level, this type of information can be used to forecast out what will your resource needs be next year, the year after. Um, you know, do you really need to ramp up the total uh, headcount for compliance initiatives um, year over year? Um, and if you do, this will give you the forward information so you can budget appropriately for follow-on years. Uh, I think it's fair to say now that, you know, everyone is just getting it done. That's the mode everyone's in. It's just we have to get it done. It's mandatory. We're just going to throw resources at it. We've got to get it done. And that's obviously a reactive mode. It would be much better to have a forward plan so that you can optimize resources and budget much, much better to get it done. And that way you'd be much more cost efficient as well as managing the risk. So there's a, a couple more views. I want to leave you with one last uh, kind of view um, of, of how PPM looks, and that is this uh, around communication and collaboration. We touched on it a little bit earlier, but if we look at the, uh, the, the from the left-hand side, uh, as I mentioned, these are views of a common set of data. Everyone is looking at the same information, 
but they might have a different lens or perspective on that information, and that's entirely uh, up to the end user to determine how that looks. So it becomes a, a, a very personalized uh, system of, uh, of participating in these change projects, change initiatives. On the communication side, uh, there are numerous uh, charts and dashboards that can be used by the leadership team to make sure that they've got full visibility into the compliance initiatives, looking at you know, budgets, looking at resources, uh, looking at the priority, prioritization of, of change initiatives and other initiatives that might uh, conflict or compete for resources. Um, and, and all of this is you know, available as on the right uh, using not only the native kind of capabilities, but also using common uh, familiar tools like Excel and PowerPoint as the means of reporting and publishing. So if you've got external stakeholders, it may even be regulators, um, but certainly you know, management that are, are used to receiving updates in uh, you know, an Excel or, or PowerPoint presentation, uh, this is built right into the reporting capability of, of the Oracle and Stantis uh, solution. So you can continue to deliver reports and updates in a format that you know, the management is familiar with. It doesn't require big upheaval. And I think that's important. Uh, together with uh, the ability of, of this solution to be uh, uh, delivered from, from the cloud or, or, as a, or as a SaaS solution, uh, the ability to deliver the information in this familiar format uh, is really important because we, we can't stop what we're doing to, to implement uh, a complex technology. You know, we have to be able to uh, take advantage of, of these better uh, frameworks, this better solution, uh, but, but you know, we're in flight as it is. We, we have commitments on compliance. We, you know, we need to be able to adopt this in flight. So that's an, and these, these are important aspects of, of how this solution can be uh, deployed with the least disruption. So let me... Um, just wrap up with um, a kind of a view uh, of, of the enterprise nature of Instantis PPM, Oracle Instantis. Uh, I talked earlier about, you know, having a, a view, the, the business model, not just of the current state, but the future state. What new products, what new businesses are being planned so that our change initiatives can take account of where we're going to be, you know, not today, but tomorrow and next year and the year after. That can be extended uh, more completely uh, so that, you know, this very same solution, PPM, uh, can be used and is used uh, by functions, you know, other than compliance. Uh, product development teams use this very same solution to manage their entire product life cycle, the introduction of new products and new services. IT organizations use this solution to manage all of their uh, change. Um, so uh, starting at the portfolio level and, and addressing compliance, um, moving beyond that, you can really think of this um, as a, an enterprise-wide uh, common platform for managing all change and all projects. And, and the way this is done is that each group really has a very different uh, kind of flavor or view uh, of, the, of the capabilities that's suited to their needs. So the way you manage compliance projects won't be identical to the way you manage IT projects, but there are commonalities. And as we pointed out earlier, there are initiatives that span both. So having this central and, and, and you know, uh, unified view of initiatives really helps to coordinate these cross-functional changes that these regulations demand. Uh, let me just finish up here. I think we're right on uh, the edge of my time allowed, but uh, to summarize, PPM uh, is, I believe, a critical component uh, of any robust uh, regulatory change management framework uh, together with other technologies like GRC. The Oracle Instantis Enterprise Track PPM solution is specifically designed and used by business process leaders to improve operational quality, compliance, and performance. And it does this because it manages strategies, resources, projects, portfolios, and the costs 
associated with that. We didn't spend a lot of time today looking at the cost side, but, but managing budgets and, and tracking the costs associated with these change initiatives is important. This is an extremely uh, you know, capital-intensive uh, investment that's being made, enormous resources. Um, you know, $2 billion in one year is, is a lot of money uh, for J.P. Morgan Chase, and, and you know, these need to be tracked and, and, and controlled as best we can. So that kind of concludes the, uh, the presentation. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. You know, you can see that Oracle is uh, uh, a major uh, solution provider and partner to financial services organizations. Uh, just in financial services, we have around 11,000 staff. We help uh, over 8,500 8, customers uh, together with our partners. Uh, to do everything from complete banks transformation initiatives to, uh, you know, point solutions and, and clearly, um, you know, in this area of regulatory compliance, I think we've got a lot of capabilities that can really help manage the risk and cost associated with this change. So with that, I will hand it back to Joe to see if we have any questions. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much for that presentation, Mike. Again, that was Mike Metcalf, Director, Services Industry Strategy for Oracle. Just a quick note here, if you'd like a copy of the slides just presented, you can download those by using the drop-down menu on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Uh, let's move on to some questions here. Uh, Mike, I had a question prepared here uh, that, that read, whose responsibility is it to keep up with changes uh, in regulation? Is, is it the compliance uh, or the business units? And actually, one of our readers asked it uh, much better than that. So I'm going to read through uh, this version of the question, this very similar question. And it reads, to what degree are employees responsible for self-educating on regulatory changes uh, and how these changes affect uh, the business, as opposed to checking the box on a test administered them to them from the top down? Uh, and does this responsibility change across leadership levels and, and departments? Uh, you know, so the fundamental question being here, who's really responsible? Is it, is it a centralized compliance kind of top-down function, or are the business units ultimately uh, responsible? Yeah, that's a great question. And what, and what I've seen is obviously a combination of both. Um, uh, you know, you'll see, you know, fairly small uh, centralized uh, compliance teams. Um, and then, the, you know, there will be individuals in the business units that are responsible for compliance. Uh, at, at a more detailed level. So I, I think it is a blend. I think what's important is uh, that, you know, wherever the compliance initiative is being tracked or whoever's responsibility it is, uh, there is a, you know, a central uh, single source of truth, not just for the uh, compliance uh, rules and regulations, but also, <clears throat> as I pointed out today, uh, the actual change initiatives, the priorities, the deadlines, roles and responsibilities for, for, for affecting the change. So I think, uh, you know, it does vary and it will vary by organization, um, but it's crucial that it's coordinated um, and there's a single source of truth. The worst case is where it's a free-for-all and, you know, you may be doubling up, you, you know, you may be uh, responding to, uh, you know, one regulation uh, and, and not understanding how it might overlap or conflict with another regulation from a different business unit, those things can only really be done at a, at a kind of a central level. So the reconciliation uh, would need to be done centrally. Mike. I don't know if that, that answers the question. Absolutely. Uh, Mike, I have a question, couple questions here from our audience about uh, how this solution might work with existing uh, risk and compliance data and tools. Uh, someone's asking, uh, our management is, is used to working with Excel and PowerPoint. Uh, does this solution replace those tools? Uh, another is asking, you know, uh, what I just said, how does this solution work with existing risk and compliance data and, and tools? How, how does it fit in here? Maybe you could walk yeah. through that a little bit. Sure. Uh, well, let me start with the, uh, the governance risk and compliance um, solutions. So, um, when you, when, you, um, when you think of enterprise project and portfolio management, one of the things that, that comes along with that is, uh, you know, robust uh, integration capabilities 
um, at, the, at the data level. Uh, this is something that, you know, in almost all cases, uh, customers, uh, you know, you know, would require uh, everything from um, exchanging data with your human capital management system for resources to make sure you've got, you know, you've got the right individuals, the right roles that are being used for planning purposes. You know, that data is exchanged with your HCM system, for example. In the same way, the very same uh, kind of technologies are used to um, uh, integrate the data between your GRC system and the PPM system. So the typical feeds are going to be, um, you know, change requirements. So as, as changes are identified to specific procedures and policies and rules, uh, you know, those changes will spawn uh, change initiatives. And, and those change initiatives then get planned out and executed in the PPM system. And then on, uh, on the flip side, uh, any status, uh, any um, milestone uh, updates, uh, schedule changes would be fed back to the GRC system so that, you know, folks that are working in that environment, you know, have accurate information on, uh, you know, completion, progress, deadlines. Uh, and particularly any, you know, red flags where there might be issues or risks that, again, can flow back from the PPM system. So the, the, um, uh, these uh, PPM, enterprise PPM solution, and specifically Oracle and Stantis, is designed to integrate with and embed with other uh, enterprise systems from that perspective, whether it be delivered from the cloud or, or on-premise, which, which it can be done. With respect to the um, Excel and, and um, um, Office Project Suite tools. Um, Microsoft Project so, is another one being asked. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with Excel and, and um, PowerPoint, as I mentioned earlier, you can continue to use those um, as a report output formats. So, you know, the data is published out of the Instantis PPM solution into those tools so that you can, you know, use those formats for those f folks that are familiar with it and, and want to continue to, to consume their, their updates in that way. With respect to Microsoft Project, there, there is actually an interface so that uh, projects can be exchanged between uh, schedules, that is, ex exchanged between Oracle Instantis and Microsoft Project, so that for the folks that are using that tool, uh, those plans can easily be uh, uploaded into the PPM solution and then uh, and downloaded with any updates and revisions. So you can continue to use those tools. Um, what the PPM solution provides is, is a you know, centralized single source of truth um, allowing access across the enterprise. Uh, well, uh, we're just about out of time here, but I wanted to ask you another question about uh, you mentioned uh, resource planning, uh, budget planning. Uh, and my question is, uh, can that be very difficult uh, given that some of these regulations seem to be somewhat of a moving target, um, how, how do you scale kind of up and down based on, you know, guidance that can come out on any given regulation that says, uh, you know, we, we're expecting companies to do maybe more than they thought, uh, or, you know, there, there's a lot of um, uh, kind of feedback coming in that, uh, that, that, that maybe the guidance is, okay, we didn't really mean that you have to boil the ocean here, we want, uh, and some new guidance uh, kind of scales back the project. How, how do you adjust to that? It, does it seem like these can be such a moving target? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And um, so one of the things about the resource planning, in fact, um, Oracle uh, has uh, a complete guide to resource planning called the resource management maturity model because it is a, an entire topic in itself. I mean, you know, you can get very elaborate. Um, but one of the steps in this is to really plan at a high level. So your initial planning, your roadmap planning, if you will, uh, you're really looking at, uh, uh, you know, kind of roles, uh, disciplines, perhaps not down at individual levels. You really want to get a rough cut, you know, how many of, of a particular type of skill do I need to get things done? Um, and, and that may be all you need, and, and you may not go any level lower. Um, uh, and as you get more skillful at this issue of resource management, then, then you be begin to look at more fidelity. 
Um, but certainly at the beginning, particularly for this, I think you're really looking at a role level. I really want to know, you know, do I, do I have enough of, of, you know, this particular type of, uh, of, of role to be able to address the changes that are required and, and make an estimate? The other thing I would say about this is that all of these change initiatives, all of the data is preserved for historical purposes. And, and the reason for that is that you can use past initiatives, past projects, as a template for future initiatives, and you can, you know, improve, uh, you know, improve your model and your estimating as you go forward because you've got a library of what you've already done. So preserving this as a knowledge base uh, is really important uh, because you're going to get better and better. I mean, you know, we're going to be in this for, for 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 many years, and so, you know, year four of Dodd Frank, heaven forbid. Uh, you know, we'll be looking at, you know, year one and learning from what we did there. So, you know, having that library of history is really important. Well, I think that's a, an excellent place to end it. We've just about uh, run out of time here. Uh, but I want to thank you for certainly a very informative session. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about here. Uh, it can be quite scary, for, I think, for a lot of companies, uh, thinking about just the, the volume and, and pace of change. Uh, of all the regulatory demands that are coming down, and especially even when you when you add in global regulators, uh, you know it, it gets exponentially complex. Um, again, everyone, our guest was Michael Metcalf, Director of Services, Director of Services Industry Strategy for Oracle, and also a special thanks to Oracle for making this webcast possible today. A couple notes here: the webcast has been recorded; it'll be available sometime in the next day or two. Um, CPE credit is now available for our archive webcasts uh, for our subscribers. Uh, they can go on to our on-demand CPE library under the webcast tab at www.compliancesweek.com. do encourage you all to check that out. There's uh, a lot of great topics uh, on there uh, in that CPE library. Uh, and once again, to obtain your CPE credit for today's webcast after the presentation is over, uh, wait until I finish this wrap-up uh, in just a few seconds here, and at that point, the webcast will close automatically and the final exam will be presented in a separate window. If you have any trouble viewing the CPE test or receiving the CPE certificate, just send an email to info, I-N-F-O, at compliancesweek.com. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we hope you've learned uh, a bit here. And I want to thank uh, our, our hosts as well and, and Oracle for helping us today.